So we began our sermon series on worship last week. And each Sunday, we come together to participate in worship. Uh, we sing, we use instruments, we pray, we repent, and we hear God's word together. But why do we do that? So if we take a step back to pause and think, we have to wonder, why do we have this dedicated time to worship God? And what is it and what does it mean for me? What does it mean for us? And in this series, I hope we can learn and grow together in knowing who God is because the more we love God, the more we will love him. And the more we love him, the more we would want to express a love for him and to him in worship and to others as well. So my aim and our aim is to ask who we worship, what is worship, why we worship, and how we worship God. And today, we're going to look at song in the wilderness in Joshua chapter 3 and 4. Um, today, we'll explore the concept of worship in the wilderness. Wilderness meaning outside of Eden, outside of the dwelling place of God, outside of a relationship which once was perfect, unbroken, and fulfilling. Wilderness is where we are right now. The curse of sin breaks our songs for God. It incessantly shatters our desire for him. It conflicts us to serve two gods instead of the one true God. And it constantly makes our song to him out of tune, turning to other things outside of God. Romans chapter 1, 25 says, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Yet still, in the wilderness, we are called to worship. We still meet together. We are still in need, desperate for God's mercy, needing his grace. And we need the gospel to transform us and worship him together. So today's passage, Joshua chapter 3 and 4, is a, pic is a narrative of the crossing of the Jordan River. God's newly appointed um, Joshua and the people are about to cross the Jordan River. If the Red Sea sparked the beginning of the Exodus journey, the crossing of the Jordan River marked the end of the Exodus into the land of the pro God's into the land God promised. This crossing of the Jordan is a beautiful picture and proclamation of God's song, and that it is a message to him and to us that he has not abandoned us. So we will cover three points today. We're going to look at the narrative of point number one, the crossing of the Jordan River. Point number two, what they were called to do, so the call to worship. And third and lastly, our song. So what does it matter? So what? How does it matter for me? Okay. So today, uh, the passage that we're reading is very long, so please give your careful attention. Uh, we're going to read two chapters, but I'm going to just pick and highlight the important passages um, that is key to understanding our song in the wilderness. So turn to ch Joshua chapter 3, and I'm going to begin with verse 5. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, 
shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as the bearing of the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of water, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down to the sea of Arabat, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nations finished passing over the Jordan. Chapter 4. When all the nations had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. Bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon your shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people. Now skip to verse 8. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and they laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they, and they all there to this day. But the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded to Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And lastly, verses 15 through 18. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come out, out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on the dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to the place and overflowed all its banks as before. This is God's word. This is a, a long narrative, so I think it's worth mentioning the overall summary of how people cross the Jordan River. Again, this is very important for us to uh, visualize because it is a picture of God's salvation and song for us. So Joshua and the leaders prepare all the people of Israel to cross the Jordan, and here's how they do it. Number one, the Ark of the Covenant is sent ahead of the people approximately like half a mile so that it directs and leads the people. Secondly, when it reaches the Jordan, the waters of the river stops flowing so that the people crossed over on dry ground. And thirdly, the priests holding the ark stops in the midst of the Jordan until everyone passed over. Fourth, once everyone passed over, the 12 leaders from each tribe took 12 stones from the river and carried it to the other side where people were lodging. Fifth, Joshua sets up 12 stones in the midst of the river, in the midst of Jordan, where the priests were standing. And lastly, when everyone finished passing over, the priests with the ark, the waters then returned to their place. As I mentioned, this is a picture of God's salvation. God delivers his people by taking them through the dangerous waters, not by going around, not by waiting for the waters to calm down, not by asking them, hey, you guys should build a bridge or build a boat. But he miraculously delivers his people across the dangerous waters in that moment now. And the author of the book sets up the story so that each sequence of the crossing is met with a slow, incoming, crescendo suspense for the readers. In great anticipation, they keep asking, hey, what's next? What's next? What's happening next? 
And the whole sequence is climactically centered on the Ark of the Covenant, which plays a significant role in crossing the Jordan River. So what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant, good question, is a wilderness tabernacle of a chest that God instructed Moses to build in Exodus. It is a box made of acacia wood, and it's overlaid with gold. And inside the Ark are many things such as the stone tablet, which was given to Moses and his staff. The Ark was built as a physical symbol for the people that the living God was present with him and that he is holy. Though it's a chest decorated and carefully made, it could not be touched by anyone. In fact, if anyone touched the Ark of the Covenant carelessly or without precaution, they died on that spot. One of the few ways to come even close to the Ark was to sit outside of the tent of meeting where the Ark resided. And the only the high priests, only the priests were allowed to enter into this tent where the Ark of the Covenant resided. And even within this tent, this barrier, if anyone entered carelessly, they died. Therefore, only those who are from the tribe of Levi, Levi, who were the priests, they were assigned to carry the Holy Ark of the Covenant. And they were the ones who were allowed to touch it and take care of it. Now, I think we may ask, well, why, why, why the Ark? Um, like, you know, when they crossed the Red Sea, Moses just declared, um, Yahweh, please sell, save us, and the water split. Why the Ark of the Covenant? And in fact, why will we die if we will want to approach the Ark of the Covenant? Isn't that cruel? Maybe some of us may be asking that. But I want to highlight verse 11 in chapter 3 one more time. It says this, Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. Now, pretty much if you read all the biblical translations of this, it says the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. But in Hebrew, its closer translation is, Behold, the Ark of the Covenant, comma, the Lord of all the earth. So again, behold, the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord of all the earth. So the author of Joshua is centering the Ark and centering in on the identity of who they are rendering worship and fear to. This Ark isn't just a nice, beautiful box that represents God, but is the Lord of all the earth himself. He is the one miraculously stopping the flowing waters. He is the one allowing the people to cross safely. He is the one who is placed, who is in the middle of the dangerous waters because he is present with everyone and he is allowing everyone to pass through. This is why when people carelessly touch the ark, they are actually forgetting who and what this ark represents because they are standing before the holy presence of God. They are touching the Lord of all the earth. And we are sinners, and that he is holy. God's not confined in a box. But I think more often than not, we do put him, and we do think we often put him in a box. Because it is terrifying and unsafe for us if we were to like if we were to stand before God in his holy presence, his presence is actually terrible to us. It's terrible. Because we are sinners and we are filled with death and decay and destruction that is out of character, out of nature with God, who is perfect and beautiful. But this was not meant to be. We were meant to stand before God safe and secure, able to walk with him, able to converse with him, able to commune with him, and able to enjoy him. But because of Adam and Eve's sin, sin destroyed that relationship. Death and destruction came. This is the price of sin for a fallen world. Where once God dwelt in glory and beauty, we can also dwell in safety and security. So why the ark? It wasn't really for him, but it was more for us. 
It was for our safety. It was for us as his people. So that his blazing glory wouldn't consume us, but instead, this symbol, this Ark of the Covenant, which represents God, who is God himself, is inviting us to see that he is holy and we are not. And he deserves all the honor and glory. However, there's good news. There is love and mercy from God. Remember I said this is a picture of salvation. The beauty of this crossing of the Jordan River is this. It's not that God protects them from the dangerous waters and allows them safe passage through deep waters, but each and every one of the people who cross the Jordan River, every single one of them, got to see, they got a glimpse of this holy, untouchable rock of the covenant. From the least to the greatest, from every tribe of Israel, every slave, every person, everyone, Rahab and her family, the foreigners, people outside who were not Israelites, they saw each and every one. They saw the ark, and they did not die. And when every one of God's people crossed the river safely, something happened in their hearts to wonder and worship. And the command to set up 12 stones isn't just a command, but it is their heartfelt response and worship. So here's the second point, the call to worship. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 4, and we're going to read 19 through 24, the rest of chapter 4. Verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal at the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So once out of the waters, the Israelites quickly encamped at a place called Gilgal. And at Gilgal, they set up these 12 stones. And here's why. Number one, why at Gilgal? Gilgal was a place of great evil, and it represented what was detestable to God. Amos chapter 4, 5 says, do not enter into Gilgal, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile. Hosea chapter 9, verse 15 says, every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. So in setting up the 12 stones at Gilgal, what God was communicating to us, to Israel, was the oncoming battle and the idols and the difficulties and the many sins that they will eventually face. When they travel beyond Gilgal, they're going to be faced with more evil, more idolatry everywhere. It's not just Egypt. It wasn't just when they were in the Exodus journey, but even beyond Gilgal, for the rest of their journey, they are going to be faced with idols. They will face temptations and dangers, and they will forget so these 12 stones, these stone monuments were set out to remind them of God's goodness and presence in the midst of where God, where Israel was in their trials, in their dangers. Secondly, the scripture tells us that the stones were set up to remind the next generation. Just as it was visible reminder and comfort for those who crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan, it was a message to their future generations, those who have not crossed the Jordan River or experienced the Exodus journey. It was for their children. It was for the future generations that God is good and his mercy is even extended to them. The stones are meant to invigorate the hearts and minds of Israel when they were enslaved at Egypt. 
when God through Moses delivered them out of slavery, and when they sung songs of slavery, demonstrating his power and might through the plagues, when God showed mercy and grace through the Passover lamb, when he gave way for the people to cross the Red Sea and defend his people from their oppressors, when he was with them in the wilderness, feeding them water, manna, and revealing the word of God to them. All that happened, and they were to teach and instruct their children, because just as God was with them, he will be also with their children. The monument compelled people to remember, and in their remembrance, honor and worship the Lord by teaching their children who he is. Perhaps the two monuments were set up as a reminder for his people in different seasons. One set at Gilgal to remind them every day because it's publicly and visibly available who God is and what he has done. And another set in the middle of the Jordan by Joshua so that it is not only seen when the waters would dry up, perhaps it was set up that way, especially in seasons of drought and of lacking the monument is doubly visible too. And set up as a reminder, especially today, even when they have absolutely nothing, when they have no waters, when they have nothing, God is still with them. To our parents, one of the lasting gifts and ways we can worship God together is to gently teach our children who God is and what he has done for you by telling your story to your children. And one of the practical applications to it is family worship at home. And perhaps those of us who are unfamiliar with this, maybe this is something, even if you're not a parent, this is something that we can all pray for, long for, and hope for, so that together as a family, we can render worship and remember God. To our volunteers and to our leaders, to those serving here at this church, one of the lasting gifts and worship to God is to give your church. Give this gift of you living out a remembrance of God. Worshiping, loving, and communing with the Lord unashamedly. Let your private confession of faith lead to a public declaration of your faith. And may your actions and words compel and inspire our guests, friends, and onlookers to also wonder, who is God for you? And they can see a glimpse of that through your actions and your deeds. And for all of us here, we are all in the wilderness. We have like monuments we have something like a 12 stone monument. We have Sunday worship. We have Sunday gathering. And it's a place of sanctuary for us to be with God together as a church. It's not just an opportunity to worship God and look to him together. But it's also an opportunity to also share and commune together as his family and enjoy God together. And we lose sight of that opportunity when we come thinking that it doesn't matter. I'm just here because a tradition, or I'm just here because my friends are here. Or it doesn't matter when we come with complaining, unrepentant hearts. Sunday gathering is a visible reminder for us to remember, remember to remember our great king who knows our needs. So the call to worship is this. The stone monument is set up to teach and remind who God is and what he has done, moving everyone to remembrance and to worship God. But unfortunately, the Israelites failed to remember God and honor him. They and their future generations, their children, were met with more trials, more tribulations, more pride, more sins, more injustice, and more failures. God's amazing covenant did not mean much to them because they constantly turn to idols and away from the Lord. But fortunately, and ultimately, the stone monument was set up to give way and point to the future coming eternal rock, our rock of salvation. 
the greater promise, the greater covenant, Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we are able to remember, respond, and rejoice as we live out the gospel. And here's the third and last point, our song. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for me? God is with us today. It is true for us even today that standing before God is terrifying and unsafe. His presence is terrible to sinners. If, in fact, if we were to touch the Ark of the Covenant then, back then, we would have surely died too. And the Ark of the Covenant was a visible reminder that God is good and that God was with them. But we don't have the Ark of the Covenant here with us today. Nor in our lifetime, nor will we ever get a chance to get a glimpse of the Ark. If there's anything that we should remember today from this passage, it's this. It is a sovereign and peaceful assurance. We don't have the Ark of the Covenant with us today, but we have something far greater, far more precious, far more valuable, far more glorious than the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what that is? We have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our most beautiful Savior, our friend who is with us and for us today. He is our chief cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. Because of Christ, we stand before God, not condemned, but redeemed. We all should have died in the Jordan River of sin and death. We all should have paid the price of sin our sin and our mistakes and our failures. But because Jesus Christ came to the Jordan in our stead, we can live. And we can see this at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Matthew chapter 3 says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, but do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus could have been baptized anywhere. He could have been baptized in Galilee. But he came all the way down to the Jordan River specifically so that he can fulfill all righteousness. When Jesus Christ, the Lord of all the earth, much glorious, far greater than then the Ark of the Covenant. When he approached the Jordan River, did the Jordan River split as it should have? When Jesus Christ, the pinnacle symbol of salvation, when he approached the deep waters, did the waters let him pass? In fact, when John the Baptist, a sinner, but still a person of God, when he touched Jesus Christ, the Lord of all the earth, to baptize him. Did John die? No. Jesus died so that we can live. Israel's call to worship in remembrance is our call to remembrance, is our call to worship. Israel's song of hope is all who came before Jesus. It is a slave song sung in the chains of Egypt. And it is moved to a wilderness song in the desert, sung loudly to declare that God is with them. It is a song written by God, and he directs all of us in this room to worship him. Let me give you an illustration to really unpack what I'm saying. Imagine with me two Christians, just two random Christians. I'm just going to name them Kevin and Devin. Um, great, great Christian names. Kevin and Devin, they both love the Lord, and they faithfully came, come to church every Sunday. But one Saturday evening, they were having a conversation, and Kevin says to Devin, yo, man, 
I don't, I don't think I can worship God this Sunday. I'm not sure. And Devin replied, what, what do you mean, bro? God commands us to love him and to enjoy him and to worship him. We have to. You and I, we have to. Kevin says, well, I'm not sure. This week's, it was just so hard. I don't have the confidence. I don't have the strength. Sin is overcoming me. But Devin says in confidence, I trust in the Lord with all my heart, and I'll follow him through and through. Even though I may have my ups and downs, God is with me, and he's with me right now. And I'm going to worship God tomorrow in faithfulness and anticipation. So the next day, both came to church, both participated in praise, both prayed, and both listened to the word of God. Between Kevin and Devin, whose worship honored and pleased the Lord more? The answer is both. Both were pleasing to God. Our worship is pleasing to God not because of our exercised faith, not because of our Bible reading plan, not because of the eloquence of our prayers, not because of the ministries we serve, not because of our tears drop when we prayed, but because of Christ's perfect righteousness and worship. Our wilderness song is pleasing to the Lord because Christ sang on our behalf. So friends, be comforted when you struggle to worship, when you struggle to sing, because even still in your struggle, he listens to you. God listens to you in Christ. So be empowered when you worship because you are growing and maturing in Christ. Be hopeful knowing that we will all worship him eternally. And be comforted. Don't beat yourself up whenever you think, that you need to have proper hearts, or if you're tempted to compare your faith to others. Compare your faith to Christ. And when you compare your faith to Christ, God finds it pleasing. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very awestruck and in wonder of the mystery of the gospel. We can only wonder why you would have come to save us because we, we jacked up. There's just so much that we try and we attempt to do. We turn away from you. We serve other idols. We are more pleased with the gifts than the, than the one who provides the gifts. We find more satisfaction in creative things than our creator. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for not only turning away from you, but also carelessly, inappropriately, and also haphazardly, without care of our own sin, with pride, attempted to be like you. But Lord, Christ came so that he will give himself up, that he will be in the midst of the Jordan River on our behalf so that we can all get to the other side. We have something far greater than the Ark of the Covenant. And in fact, we have something far greater than the 12 stone monument. We have Jesus Christ. And he is our daily reminder. And Holy Spirit, you are even more beautiful in encouraging us and in pushing us to remember Christ. So King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our Heavenly Father, as we respond in worship, may you be pleased with our song today and be with us as we sing to you. Thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.